Hello everyone. Welcome to the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee's online worship service. I'm Reverend Dina McFeeters and I'm honored to serve as Associate Minister. We welcome people of all genders, sexualities, ages, races, ethnicities, histories, and bodies. We welcome your mind, your heart, and your spirit. We welcome all that you are carrying with you today and all that your heart longs to set down. We'd like to pay a special welcome to guests joining us today. If you're visiting for the first time or joining us from afar, why don't you say hello in the chat and tell us where you're joining us from. I welcome you to our worship service today by inviting you to repeat our mission after me. We gather to nurture the spirit, engage the mind, and inspire action. Let's return to our beloved sanctuary for the lighting of the flaming chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism. Hello, my name is Patrick Mulvey and I'm honored to be your worship associate today. I'm fortunate to teach at a school that I love. Between my field placement, volunteering, enrolling my own children there, and teaching, it's been 25 years and counting. This school is more than a school to me. It's a community. That's not to say the work is always easy. Among the many other duties as required parts of the teaching is tracking down and prevention of bathroom stall graffiti. Not my favorite part of the job, but one time it got personal. The other teachers and I had narrowed down the possible culprit to the 7th and 8th grade boys cohort just by the time frame in which the graffiti was appearing. It was mostly garden variety stuff, swear words, crude stick figures, the usual. But then one day, whoever was doing it wrote something offensive about my son and my daughter's bodies. And keep in mind, my son and daughter were students at the school, a good bit younger than the 7th or 8th graders. This was clearly directed at me, not my children, but still, it needed to stop. I asked the 7th and 8th grade teachers if I could address the boys in the unit the following day. When the time came, I headed down there, not knowing what I was going to say. I think I'd imagined some version of dropping the hammer. I was angry, and sometimes the smart play is to let that anger show. Sometimes it isn't. When I sat down in the circle, that's how we did things there. Circles were a, a customary format for talking about problems and sharing solutions. All of my anger dissipated. Looking at these young men, each, every, each, uh, every, each and every one of which I had taught and cared for in fifth and sixth grade, I didn't see enemies or vandals. I saw kiddos that I loved and cared about and whom I had told repeatedly when I was their teacher that I loved them and I'd always be there for them. And I had meant it. So that's what I did. I mentioned what had been written in the stall about my children, and I said something like this. That's not you. I know each and every one of you, and you're not the kind of guys who would lash out at little kids like that. I'm guessing that I did something that made one of you angry or hurt your feelings. I don't know what it could have been or what I could have said, but you know me, and you know I'd never want to hurt you. And if I did, I'm sorry. I only ever want the best for you, and you know that. Up to this point, I think I was essentially guilt-tripping whoever was doing the graffiti. What I said next wasn't planned. Inspiration just struck. I said, I'm not here to get you in trouble. I'm here to help you out of trouble. You don't want to be that guy, and I don't want you to be that guy either. You know where I am, and you can come talk to me anytime. If I did you wrong, I hope I can make it right. If you need some help, I hope I can give it. I love you all, and I'll always be your teacher. Thanks, fellas. They applauded. I hadn't seen that coming. 
but I felt their approval, not as an audience, not as my students, but as people. The people I had reminded them, I believed them to be as worthwhile and as important as me or anybody else. I chose to come back to the love and humility that I try to bring when I work with my students and on my better days to everyone around me. And that had reaffirmed our connection. You know, we never did find out who was writing that graffiti. No one came forward. None of the guys reached out. No one confessed. But it stopped. Wendell Berry wrote in an essay called, What Are People For? I was walking one Sunday afternoon several years ago with an older friend. We went by the ruining log house that had belonged to his grandparents and great-grandparents. The house stirred my friend's memory, and he told how the old-time people used to visit each other in the evenings especially in the long evenings of winter. There used to be a sort of institution in our part of the country known as sitting till bedtime. After supper, when they weren't too tired, neighbors would walk across the field to visit each other. They popped corn and ate apples and talked. They told each other stories they told each other stories that they all had heard before. Sometimes they told stories about each other, about themselves, living again in their own memories and thus keeping their memories alive. Among the hearers of these stories were always the children. When bedtime came, the visitors lit their lanterns and went home. My friend talked about this and thought about it. And then he said, they had everything but money. They were poor as country people have often been, but they had each other. They had their local economy in which they helped each other. 
They had each other's comfort when they needed it. And they had their stories, their history together in that place. Although Barry may risk sentimentalizing poor rural folks, there is something in this story that reminds me of my desires for spiritual community, neighbors who trust each other, enough to tell stories about things that happened to them, people who love each other enough to listen to those stories again and again, children in the room partaking of the stories, giving and receiving comfort when needed, creating and supporting their local economy, sharing history in a place and a tradition of sitting together. It is such a blessing to sit with you in community, First Church. It's been hard to do over the last two plus years while physically separated by the pandemic. It was such a gift we had in the before times, not knowing we were taking it for granted. Such a gift to return to, the gift of making ourselves part of history in a place, sitting together, telling stories, even the ones we've heard again and again, even the hard stories, even the new stories. It is so good to know you, to know each other with the expectation and experience of love. Parker Palmer wrote in his book, To Know and Be Known, the goal of a knowledge arising from love is the reunification and reconstruction of broken selves and worlds. A knowledge born of compassion aims not at exploiting and manipulating creation, but at reconciling the world to itself. The mind motivated by compassion reaches out to know as the heart reaches out to love. Here, the act of knowing is an act of love, the act of entering and embracing the reality of the other of allowing the other to enter and embrace our own. In such knowing, we know and are known as members of a community and our knowing becomes a very way of reweaving that community's bonds. This love, he wrote, is not a soft and sentimental virtue, not a fuzzy feeling of romance. The love of which spiritual tradition speaks is tough love, the connective tissue of reality. And we flee from it because we fear its claims on our lives. He continues, control creates a knowledge that distances us from each other in the world, allowing us to use what we know as a plaything and play the game by our own self-serving rules. But a knowledge that springs from love will implicate us in the web of life. It will wrap the knower and the known in compassion, in a bond of awesome responsibility, as well as transforming joy. It will call us to involvement, mutuality, accountability. I want to talk about one of the tensions in liberal religion between individualism and community, because I think it may be the crux of why love in community is not always fuzzy. I recently reread work by some of my UU colleagues that illuminates the struggle. In her essay, The Power of Community and the Peril of Individualism, the Reverend Cheryl M. Walker shares her personal religious history and how it impacts her experience in Unitarian Universalist community. Here is what she says. Sunday morning, my family and I are on our way to worship services. We walk the streets of Harlem, my brother and father in dark suits with bow ties, my sisters, my mother, and I dressed in white. The sea of people parts to let us pass. We are strong and confident, invulnerable. 
It is the early 60s, and we are on our way to Muhammad's Mosque number seven. We will meet others like us and greet each other with the familiar hand grasp, kiss, and blessings of Asalam alaikum, peace be unto you. We are powerful. Our power comes from our collectiveness. Our power comes from being as one unit, dressed alike, sharing the same rituals, praying alike. Because we act as one, we are able to build schools, publish newspapers, and start businesses. We have an unshakable sense of who we are and are secure in our being. We are not like so-called Negroes, and we are proud Black women and men. It shields us from the racism that is pervasive in all other parts of our lives. Our difference feels like a badge of honor, not one of shame. Yet a shadow side exists. We are strong only if we are willing to conform. Individuality is discouraged. The rules are strict and there is no tolerance for breaking them. You cannot show up on Sunday morning wearing a red dress. Individuality is a willing acceptance of otherness and there was no room for otherness. The price to pay for this type of community, the price to pay for the power of this type of community is the loss of individuality. For some, me included, she wrote, the price became too high and so in my teenage years, I made the choice to separate from the community, not from the faith, but from the community, for I still loved many things about the faith of my childhood. I kept my faith, but lost my religion, because religion is always communal. You cannot be religious all by your lonesome. You can be spiritual, but not religious. Religion is always communal, whereas being spiritual is an individual expression of faith. We create religion to find ways to express our spirituality in community. After many years of wandering in the wilderness, Walker attended worship at a UU church on the invitation of a friend. There, she said, I fell in love with being an individual in a faith community. You mean I don't have to believe what I don't believe and that's okay? My faith journey is my faith journey, not the one you've neatly mapped out for me. I was a kid in a candy store. Me, me, me. This religion was created with me in mind. It offered me freedom and I dove right in. Then I also discovered a shadow side. There was no discipline of faith. It required little of me. All I had to do was sign a book and give some money and voila, I was a Unitarian Universalist. But there was little cohesion. Everyone had come thinking this religion was made just for them. Therefore, everyone thought Everything should be for them. This wasn't individuality. It was individualism, worship of the individual. Hmm. Last month, I talked with you about different types of knowing and lifted up a few pieces of our Unitarian history that affirm the use of reason in religion, which William Ellery Channing and others championed and also the kind of knowing that comes from direct experience of the divine and the guidance of intuition that the transcendentalists celebrated. But now our movement is at the point of critiquing our heritage for the transcendentalist emphasis on self-reliance and Channing's emphasis on self-culture. 
Although both concepts are valuable, developing the skill to know what you believe in your own mind and rely on yourself, and dedicating your energy to cultivate what Channing called the divine seed within to grow your own soul. Those are valuable, not enough to forge community that can withstand and transform evil. What it means to be human must encompass more. Nancy MacDonald Ladd wrote in her book, After the Good News, the 20th century Unitarian ethicist, James Luther Adams, claimed history is much like human nature in that both contain a fundamentally tragic dimension. History is and has always been, as he said, a theater of conflict in which the tensions between the will to mutuality and the will to power appear in their most subtle and perverse forms. In short, history is tragic. Ladd continues, it is tragic not just because of the nature of history itself, but because of the nature of humankind and the opposing wills that govern it. To Adams, these wills are always at work in the human heart. They are what pulls us toward self-destruction or interconnection. And he called them respectively, the will to power and the will to mutuality. In the story Adams tells about our nature, it is not a genteel process of respectable self-culture that forms the basis of a strong moral character, but a constant visceral battle between these wills. This weekend, the Sikh Temple of Wisconsin commemorated the 10 year anniversary of the mass shooting on August 5th 2012, when a white supremacist with a gun entered their worship service in Oak Creek, shot and killed six people and injured more. An article in the journal Sentinel said it was the deadliest mass casualty attack on a house of worship the country had seen in almost 50 years. Since then, in the spirit of Charity Kala, the Oak Creek Sangha community has worked to heal and demonstrate unwavering courage, strength, and resilience in response. Hardeep Singh Kaleka, Executive Director for the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee, who has spoken here, defined Charity Kala as relentless optimism to many, it may sound naive, but in the spirit of how it's quoted, it's a defying courage, he said. We shall be relentlessly optimistic and continuing to build a world where all people are loved and nurtured. Theologian Carter Hayward said, love is a choice not simply or necessarily a rational choice, but rather a willingness to be present to others without pretense or guile. Love is a conversion to humanity, a willingness to participate with others in the healing of a broken world and broken lives. Let's return to the Reverend Cheryl Walker's story. Walker wrote, I love the promise of this faith, but when I, as a person of color, look at us, I wonder, in some ways I find in UUism the same conformity I found intolerable in my childhood faith in the nation of Islam. The only difference is that this conformity is more dangerous for me. 
because this conformity asks that I make the dominant white culture my culture. From the music we sing, to the styles in which we worship, to the way we look at time, the dominant culture prevails. People of color struggle to hold on to their identity within UU congregations. And we find that our cultures are not valued in the same way as the dominant culture. As a black woman, she wrote, I am expected to give up my individuality in order to fit in while others hold on tightly to theirs. This conformity would try to undo all that I learned in my youth of my inherent beauty and goodness. And that makes it a dangerous proposition for me and other people of color. I am willing to give up some parts of my individuality and culture but not all of it. And I am increasingly unwilling to give up some if everyone else is unwilling to do the same. True community, she continues, doesn't happen unless everyone is willing to give up some of their identity as an individual to take on the identity of the group. If this doesn't happen, then we are merely a group of individuals sharing common space, but not becoming a community. It doesn't mean that we go to the extremes of everyone wearing the same clothing, everyone praying the same way, if at all, or everyone believing the same things. If we were to do that, we would give up what makes us unique on the religious landscape. However, it does mean that we move individualism from the center of our focus and replace it with a new concept of shared community in which everyone gives up a little so that we can gain a lot. In true community, we gain a lot, she concludes. We gain affirmation of who we are both as individuals and as part of a group. We gain the wisdom of others who may have ideas different from our own so that together we may create a greater vision of a future that we can work toward making real. Mm. Friends, love in community is not sentimental. It's not a Hallmark card kind of love. Sometimes it's hard work. In community, we don't always get to tell our own story because it is more important to listen to another person. Sometimes we disagree and conflict with one another. Sometimes we have to set aside what we want as an individual to support the good of the community. Sometimes we must temper our will to power so we can choose the will to mutuality. Sometimes we give up some of who we are so we can merge with the identity of the community that is evolving. I'll end by telling you a story from Terry Tempest Williams. She wrote about a trip she took with a friend to Spain. She wrote, we found ourselves in the Donana National Park, one of the last remaining wetlands in Europe. We were there during spring migration, so we were able to witness waves of birds from both the European and African continents. The wetlands happened to be on the edge of a beautiful town called El Rocio. We went on a Sunday morning to see the flamingos and the spoonbills. On the edge of the marsh is a beautiful whitewashed adobe santuario. An old woman handed each person there a large candle. She said, light this candle with your desire in mind. Let your desire pierce your heart and take it home with you. 
The people lighted their candles with their desires in mind and then moved to an alcove to put their candle onto a huge iron rack. In this white tiled room with a statue of the mother of dew, each person stood next to their candle and tended to their desire, watching while the wax melted. When the wax had melted sufficiently to make a ball of it, each person took the wax home as a talisman. The room was searing. There had to be hundreds, even thousands of candles all burning at the same time with people attending to their individual desires. It was wonderful. My friend said to me, my desire is melting into everyone else's. And that was precisely the point. When you're in that collective space, there is no way your desire won't merge with everyone else's desire. They are the desires of our highest selves. Hmm. First church community, as we enter a process of talking and listening in joyful focus groups this month, let us bring our individuality, but not our individualism. Let us bring our individual candles of desire and watch for the melting wax, the merging of desires for the future of our loved and loving religious community. Let us not flee from the connective tissue of reality. Let us not fear its claims on our lives. Let us open ourselves to love's claim. May what we learn wrap us in compassion, in a bond of awesome responsibility, as well as transforming joy. May it be so. Dear ones, I'll leave you with these closing words by Arthur Foote. May peace dwell within our hearts and understanding in our minds. May courage steal our wills and love of truth forever guide us. May it be so. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there.